we are just about ready for the first talk. Uh, I would like to introduce Imran Parker. Imran? Yeah, please. Uh, while you put on this hands-free mic, um, Imran is going to be talking about distributed microservices in the real world. Um, a few notes about this fine gentleman. Uh, this guy. Um, uh, Imran uh, works for Career Junction. Uh, I hear he's been working with Python for more or less a decade, um, which is it's actually not that young a language anymore. This is strange. Um, uh, in case you need to bribe him, he is susceptible to chilies and biltong. Uh, and otherwise, uh, do you want to check that mic works? You may need to push the button on the top. It should go. There you go. Hello. In, in, speak Hello. directly into the microphone. Well, that would help. Out. Hello. There we go. go. Okay. Okay. It works. Cool. Um, Just get that otherwise? back on because my alter ego. Um, I think I need Thank you very much. Excellent. Just give me a, a minute just to get everything set up. Thanks, David. He's David, right? Forget names. Yes. Okay, so while we're doing that. There we go. I'm actually running a Windows VM inside, inside Ubuntu just to run my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure, right? Just hold on, let me just get this thing sorted. It seems to not be working this time. That might be better. There we go. So thank you very much, David, for that introduction. So um, I'm super excited to be here today um, to, to let you know what we've been doing at Career Junction. So, um, We've been running microservices for about six years now at Career Junction. Um, so I'm going to share uh, what we've done, how we've done it, and how we've moved from a monolithic architecture to a microservice architecture, and all the lessons we learned along the way. Um, but first, um, I just want to give a little bit of introductions. Um, I was going to give an introduction about myself, but obviously David did a great job about that, so I'm just, I'm just going to skip over that one. So, my goal in the next 45 minutes or so is to share the knowledge that we've gained over the last um, six years. Um, everything that we've done, everything that we did. And it's to give you the tools and the information so that you can make an informed decision. Um, our, most likely our situations are very different. Um, I'm not going to stand here and advocate anything by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you might be of the opinion that microservices is a bunch of hogwash and should never be used by muggles at all. Um, and that's okay, you know. Unfortunately, you still have to sit there and listen to what I have to say, so I win, <laughs> right? On the other hand, you might be running microservices already in your environment or thinking about moving towards a microservices architecture, okay? So, uh, so hopefully, as I go through the, as I go through the talk, um, you'll see some similarities about how we do things and how you do things. Ultimately, I want you to learn from our success, but more importantly, I want you to learn from our mistakes so that you don't repeat them, okay? So a little bit about background about, about Korea Junction. Um, Korea Junction's no spring chicken. It's been around for a while. Um, and so what have we been doing for the last 21 years? So our main focus is building solutions for the recruitment industry. We bring people who are looking for jobs and people supplying jobs together in one single space. Okay, it sounds simple, but it's not quite. So how does Python fit into that framework? So, Python basically does, or we do use Python to do all our heavy lifting, all right? We do a lot of data capturing using Python, we mine data using Python, and we do a lot of analysis on that data using Python. We then take the result of all of that, and we again use Python to create awesome tools for the industry, okay? Um, as any other IT company, our technology stack is quite varied. Um, there's a lot more than that. Those are the ones I could find logos for and actually fit on the screen, so that's just about it, right? <laughs> All right, so let's move along. Um, I'm now going to talk about what I'm actually going to be covering um, in this talk. Okay. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to be telling you a story. And it's the story about how Career Junction went from a large monolith to the microservices we have today. 
I'm going to briefly cover um, modern software development, um, how we do it today, and hopefully by the end, it's basically just to give you, kind of set the scene for the, uh, for the story. And hopefully by the end of the story, I would have answered the question, why choose a microservices architecture? Okay. The next part is the fun part, right? the ones that you actually want to see. So we'll have to do the boring part stuff first, but essentially we'll then look under the hood of the Career Junction microservices framework. I'll cover the requirements we had when building it, the conceptual architecture. I'll then dive quite deep into each of the components and its subsystems. So we're going to actually look at some cool stuff. Okay. Then I'm going to demonstrate the features of the framework. And we're actually going to do that by actually looking at some code, coding it, and actually running it. So you can actually see it running in action all on my laptop there. And lastly, I'm just going to cover some benefits and some points to, spawn, uh, points to ponder on when running microservices in your environment. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about software development in the modern age. Right? This is all my opinion, so don't, don't think of it as your, yours or any consensus or anything like that. But uh, in my opinion, to be, so, to be successful at software development today, you kind of have to get three things right. Okay? You have to get your resources right, the process, your processes right, and your architecture. Okay? So under, your pro under resources, you have to consider things like how your organizational structure is going to look, how you're going to manage your teams. Okay? Um, under your processes, you have to de define how you're going to manage requirements coming from the business. All right? Things like, um, how, that includes the entire software development life cycle. Right? Do you go agile? Do you go, do you go waterfall or a combination of the two? Okay? And then your architecture defines your standards, your guidelines, how you manage code changes, how you manage code quality, and ultimately how you build your software. Okay. So in order to get all of those three right, you'll, I just want to talk a little bit more about them. So each of those themselves are actually very much linked together. Whatever you decide in the one definitely affects the other two. Okay? And within the context of software development, this under resources, for example, there's a, there's a growing notion that we should be working in smaller teams or teams of teams. No longer do you have 30, 40 developers all working together. You break them up into smaller teams of about six to eight people. Okay? And those teams should be able to work independently of each other. What does that drive? It drives the need or the, or the need towards continuous delivery. We always want to deliver more often and more quickly. All right. So what about architecture? Okay. So on the one hand, we have the monolithic architecture, and on the other hand, we have the microservices architecture. So what, which one do I choose, and why choose one over the other? I mean, each of them has their own advantages and disadvantages. But if we look at software development today, sometimes that choice isn't yours. Okay? Um, if you look at it, typically successful software started as something like a POC, some proof of concept. I mean, all of us have done that before. You, you create a proof of concept, you show it off to somebody in business, and they go, we love it. We like it, we want it. And then you go, okay, fine, we're going to do this now. And they say, no, 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 but we want it now. Right? So you go, what you do is you then build on top of that. And you build more on top of that. And then you, next thing you know, somewhere down the line, you're in monolithic hell. Right? And Career Junction was definitely no different. And that's where the story started with Career Junction. And when I say started, I mean 10 to 12 years ago. Yes, I've been there that long. Right? So about 10 to 12 years ago, Career Junction was quite a simple ecosystem. We had one code base. And the entire IT team consisted of about eight people, eight people in total. All right? We had everything bundled together, all our business logic and everything all bundled nicely in one. So how did that look? So if you look at it there, so we then um, looked at those and we said, okay, and all of those then talked to the database that stores our data. What we did was we bundled all of that together as one application and we deployed it as one. Okay? So 10 years ago, that definitely worked for us. It did. Right? So why? Because it was easy to develop, easy to test, and easy to deploy. Right? And it was simple to scale as well. You just make copies of your application, put a load balance in front of it, and, and off you went. Okay? And if that was the end of it, great. But with all successful software, you get in more requirements coming. For example, we had to handle new devices later on. So what do you do? You add some more code. Right? You hire some more people. They add some more code. Right? So over time, your code base grows. And it just continues to grow. And then what you find at the end of the day, and what happened at Career Junction, we found out that we were doing more code management than actual coding. We were handling things like merge conflicts and refactoring code for performance and things like that, and actually building real functionality. 
Okay, so over time we started seeing diminishing results. It started getting where a change that used to take days to complete now takes weeks or sometimes, um, I'm sorry to say, sometimes months. Okay, and that was really bad. So how does that stack up against the modern software development principles I spoke about it earlier? You can have small teams, but they certainly can't work independently of each other because you still have one big monolithic application. And then that translates directly to not being able to deliver continuously. So we found that as a problem. We realized we wanted to change what we wanted to do. Right? So we had a look around and we said, OK, fine. What do we want to do? We want to break up the monolithic application and implement microservices. So that's something we want. So we went to the business and said, this is what we want to do. The problem is we had a product that was already up and running. And unfortunately, we had to keep the planes in the air so where feature development trumps architecture development because architecture development doesn't bring in the money. So we didn't, we, we didn't have the time to actually build our architecture or redo our architecture. We just weren't allowed to uh, freeze, the, freeze the resources to free them up to kind of freeze new development to free the resources so that we could actually do it. We also weren't allowed to hire new people. So the business said to us, well, you still got to solve the problem, but I'm not going to give you time to do it. So we kind of like, okay, fine, we'll need to look around, right? I mean, there you, somebody's laughing. I mean, everybody knows there's a couple of nods going on there, right? So we said, okay, fine, we're going to investigate a couple of options. We did some R&D, but ultimately what happened was we, we came up short. We, what we did didn't really give us the gains that we needed. So we said, okay, fine, we're going to try something different. And we, what we tried, in hindsight, wasn't really a great idea. Okay? So <laughs> we broke up our monolithic application, our large one, into smaller monolithic applications. <laughs> okay. So how did that look? So here we go. So we separated our, our business logic from, from, from our display logic. So, and we took each of those modules that we had and we converted them into smaller applications. We made each team responsible for each of those applications. Um, each of those applications still spoke to the single database because we didn't have time to change that. To change that. Um, we also had to add things like each of the applications now had to expose an API to the, to the user interface to allow it to work. Okay. I must admit, um, this did work. It did work. We had a bit of autonomy. We, we started uh, we're doing less merge conflicts and things like that, so we, we were able to deliver a little bit faster. But with this kind of setup came its own problems. I'm going to discuss them as well. The first one being the database. Each application wasn't in charge of its own data. And that posed a problem because if the job application wanted to find out what users of the job belonged to, or the user application wanted to find out how many jobs that person had, they could just, because it was a SQL database, they'll just in a join on the table and off you went. So if the job application wanted to make changes to the schema, they couldn't do that in isolation. They had to really talk to the other teams. Okay? And so you lost a little bit of that autonomy over there. All right? The other thing now that happened was applications started talking to other applications. So now all of a sudden, when one of the applications wanted to make a logic change, you also couldn't do that in isolation. You also had to talk to the other teams to kind of figure out where things are going. So you again lost a little bit of autonomy over there. One of the biggest things we found as well was the extra overhead that every application had now. Okay? And essentially all the layers that formed part of that application. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to take the user application, for example, and split it on in, into its layers. So this is how it looked about 10 years ago. We were running a web server, a patch at the time with WSGI on top of it. We had our Python web framework, which was called Pylons, I think more commonly known today as Pyramid. And then we actually had the business logic or the application that we actually that want, we wanted to execute. Now, this application wasn't customer facing. So there was really no need for it to need to be able to communicate via HTTP. All those layers just added a lot more complexity to each of our applications. And I'll explain a little bit more of the issues that that brought in. Okay? Things like, for example, the setup and configuration was a little bit more difficult. It was more tedious to kind of have to set up because each of them had their own configuration. Okay? We also couldn't monitor requests um, quite easily. So you'd send a request to the web server, and then like, in which layer is it? Is it at Apache? Is it at pylons? Is it actually being executed? I couldn't, it's like, almost like it went into this black box. You couldn't really see where it was. Okay? And that made troubleshooting a little bit more difficult as well. So you send a request to the web server, now you get a timeout error. Okay, so where did the timeout occur? Did the web server give me the timeout? Was it in pylons? Did the application timeout? We really didn't know where that was. Okay, it was very difficult to kind of troubleshoot those kind of things. Now, with all those issues that we had, we still had a working solution, something that at least the business was happy with. All right? So it wasn't exactly what we needed, but it was much better than the large monolithic application we had. 
right? So we soldiered on. We even tried to patch up some of the deficiencies we had. Um, for example, we added Sentry to do logging of, um, of, our, of our warnings and errors so that we could have some visibility so that we could monitor and troubleshoot a little bit better. Okay? We standardized on our operating systems, on our package versions, and we scripted as much as we could to eliminate human error. We even changed our development practices. So what we did was we made each team um, responsible for an application end-to-end. -end. So the concept of you deploy what you develop. Right? And that helped with, with code quality and accountability. But ultimately, we, we, we were basically again seeing diminishing returns over time. Right? And we kept on patching and patching and hoping something would change. So, but as, as we're saying, we were doing the same thing over and over and over again, hoping that the light was just around the corner in the tunnel. Right? And we just kept on going with this thing. And I'm reluctant to say this, but it took us two years to realize a mistake. It took us two years to realize that, you know what, enough is enough. We're not doing, we're not getting anywhere with this, and we need to take the time to do this properly. All right? You always think that, you know, it's always just around the corner, everything's around, but it took us two years to decide that. It's a very long time, trust me, but those two years went that, that way. So we made the decision, right, we're going to go microservices architecture, and what are we going to do? So the first decision we made was to start the project and we dedicated the resources to the project. And I think that was the, one of the main reasons why we, why we actually made a success of it. I think if we didn't dedicate resources to the project, we would have ended up in insanity hell again. You know, it would have just been, it just been uh, a big balls up. Okay, so the, the team's first job, and only job actually, was to investigate the options in the market and then score each of those based on our requirements. I'll talk more about the requirements in the next section, okay? So we did some R&D, we took some time, we, we took it away, we had to take some systems, put them together maybe, mesh them up, see how it could work, um, do some implementation and see what, what, could, what, what, what would fit our needs. And remember this was about seven or eight years ago, so the concept of service-orientated architecture, or even the term microservices was in, in, was in its infancy back then, so there weren't a lot of options available. Right? And of the options that were available, some of them were very expensive or way too verbose. All right, so the ones that had the functionality we needed, but we would use like, let's say, 10 to 20% of the functionality, but we'd have to run 100% of the framework, of the solution. That would be like, I mean, hiding this entire hole for just five people. I mean, that just would be a waste of time, right, David? Exactly, thank you. Right, others had, had some of the features we, we wanted, and some others, uh, other features we wanted. So we had to combine solutions to put it together. And that was unattractive to us because it meant that we'd have more complexity, and more complexity just would bring more issues. We'd have single points of failure over here, and that's not something we wanted. Now, this was a good exercise for us, because it, it made us realize that there really wasn't anything out there seven years ago for us to be able to, to use. So we actually made the decision to actually build it ourselves. We had the expertise, we had the knowledge, we had the team, and we had the time. So I said, let's do it. All right. So, when we decided we were going to do it, we looked at how that, how that architecture would look. Based on the diagram you saw before, you know, smaller applications, what we would do to change that in order, how would that look now? So what we did was we said, okay, fine, we're going to take each application and we're going to strip all the layers out. So now you're left with just that service that you want, just the business logic that you actually wanted, right? The other decision we made is that each of them will have their own database, so therefore you have full autonomy between teams, right? We'll then put a gateway between them, which acts like a facade that will expose those services to the outside world. So that's essentially what the kind of thing that we were looking at, right? I'll explain more about how we did this actually in real practice um, later on, all right? So how does that then pan or stack up, stack up against um, the software development principles we looked at before? Now we've ticked all the boxes, we can have small autonomous teams, and we can deliver a lot faster, all right? So that's essentially how we got to the point of, of being able to do that. So that is like the journey of how Career Junction went from this monolith uh, to, to the decision that we wanted to go microservices. So that was a span of four years now that I just did in roughly 20 minutes. Okay? So that was from year 12 to year 7, essentially. Right? So I just want to summarize that journey a little bit. I just want to cover two points, just two points that you just need to take away from this journey. Okay? The first thing is, is that the monolith is not a bad idea. Okay? I'm not advocating that at all. I'm not saying that. If you can get away with a monolithic application, by all means, do so. Okay? Like I've said before, it's easy to work with, especially if your code base doesn't grow that often. All right? But 
in the case of Career Junction, and probably most of you here today, you are building large-scale applications. And in that instance, I would definitely recommend microservices. All right? The next one is, and I'm sure you've probably heard it a lot, if you are not prepared to do it right the first time, be prepared to do it twice. Okay? And that's, the, that's what Career Junction fell into. Because we didn't make the decision to do it right the first time. It took us two years to realize that we actually need to do it a second time. And you're going to have to do it a second time at some point. For us, it was two years later. And, and that was the problem. Okay? So I don't want you to make that same mistake. All right? If you really want, if you need someone to talk to, I'll talk to the business and let them, I'll convince them that you need to do it. Right? <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at the Career Junction framework. Okay? So um, the first thing I'm going to cover is, like I said before, the requirements that we had that we wanted when we built the, the, the framework. So let's look at it. The first one is, is that we wanted to make development easier. Okay, so we need a developer adoption. It's no use building something that nobody's going to use or like. Okay, so it had to be very familiar to, 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 to developers. They didn't need to learn something new. Okay? So it's something that they just could just go and go, oh, I'm familiar with this, I can use it, it's done. And yeah, ultimately we want to increase productivity. The other thing is we wanted services to be able to be written in almost any language. Okay? That allows you to move from one programming language to another um, within the same framework, or use the programming language that's best suited for that, for that purpose. And Python will always be it, so don't worry. All right. <laughs> Okay. The other thing is we wanted the, the framework to have inherent scalability both horizontally and vertically. Okay? And an acceptable level, level of fault tolerance built into the framework. Okay? We wanted services also to be discoverable so they could go away and come back whenever they wanted and that wouldn't cause any issues. Okay. We also wanted requests to have a, a message contract. So what is a message contract? It's essentially a service level agreement between the two parties. Okay? So things like the request type, the timeout, or how failures are handled can all be part of that SLA. And both parties have to agree to the SLA or the request fails immediately. All right? um, another big pain in, our, in my side, at least my side from the people that, work, that I work with, is documentation. I'm sure all of you love documentation. Right? Uh, and unfortunately with services, um, you need good documentation, especially for the people that are consuming those services. So we want the documentation to be part and parcel of the service creation process. Okay? We wanted an easy way for tasks to be scheduled, okay? because obviously we all have scheduled tasks. We have grants to run, so we all wanted that to be able to happen. Okay? And then we also wanted an easy way to monitor tasks throughout the, throughout the stack, wherever it was, so that we could do some easy debugging. And we wanted debugging to be develop, developer-friendly, so you could see stack traces and know exactly where the problem was. Okay. So now that we've, that's most of the requirements that we've gone through, those are the high-level ones. So let's look at the conceptual architecture. So before we look at the conceptual architecture diagram, um, there's a few, few decisions we needed to make. All right? So one of the first decisions we needed to make was what technologies to use. So obviously Python was the obvious choice. We were a Python house, so Python is the best choice. Um, I, I've written the Python 3, but essentially Python 3 was the second version of our architecture. Um, seven years ago, we wrote the first version of our architecture in Python 2.7. We rewrote it last year, January, Andre? Yeah, last year, January. Um, because we want to take advantage of the new stuff in Python 3, like async IO, for example. So we did that. We also use ZDMQ. For those who don't know, it's a networking concurrency library. Um, it, does, it handles all the networking bits for you, so you don't have to manage that, things like the connections and things. And it also exposes a bunch of design patterns, things like pub, sub, pipeline, and request reply for you, so that you don't have to worry about it. Okay? You can go read up on it, uh, on it there. Okay, then we, the decisions we made around messaging. So the messaging, we made sure that we wanted a reliable request re reply dialogue. So you, you send a request, you get a reply. We're a website, so typically that's how it works. A client sends a request, and he gets a reply. All right? uh, we based it on the ZMQ major domo pattern. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, it will be part of the diagram that I'm going to show next. But we added some career junction flavor to that pattern as well. For serialization, we chose JSON. The reason why we did that, because most languages supported, libraries are available. And most importantly, it's readable. So for it's easier, makes it much easier to debug. Okay? So let's have a look at how that architecture looks. So this is based on the major demo pattern. And if you look at, remember that I showed you the gateway with our services? So what we did was we said those gateways will be called our brokers. Now we've got two brokers there because obviously we have fault tolerance and load balancing over there. Then below that, we have our workers. Now those are actually the services that get run. So over there, conceptually, I've got a tea worker, a coffee worker, and a water worker, right? Then above that, we have our clients that connect to the brokers. And all workers connect to all brokers. Okay, so it's 
So, it's that kind of, so that's our conceptual architecture. So let me take you through a quick how a request would work. So let's say that client there over there on the left-hand side wants some tea, okay? Because I'm a tea guy, I'm not a coffee guy, right? And then you'd send that request to the broker. The broker would then go, do I have a worker available to service that request? Yes, I do. I'll then send it off to that tea worker. The tea worker would process it, send it back to the broker, and which will then pass it on back to the client. Simple, nothing, nothing, nothing weird, nothing, anything. So that's quite simple. So in this context as well, a worker itself could also be a client. So when that worker there needed to make the tea, in order to make tea, it needed water. So the tea worker would ask the broker for some water. And then the broker would go, do I have a water worker? Yes, I do. Send it to the water worker. Water worker would send it back and send it back to the worker. So that's how services then spoke to other services. Okay. So that's basically the conceptual architecture of how, how we wanted to build it. Okay, so let's look at each of those components in a little bit more detail, and we'll start with the broker. So what's the broker responsible for? So it's essentially an intermediary between the clients and, 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 and the workers, right? It's also responsible for exposing services via HTTP and distributing requests um, uh, evenly between all the workers, okay? Since it's the central point between, it, between the two, it's also responsible for logging all, all of those requests. So in order to accomplish this, it has four subsystems, and we'll discuss them a little bit more, right? So let's look at the transport subsystem. So it handles all the, all the connections. It also handles all the data transfer between clients and workers, things like serialization and deserialization of data. And it also handles broadcasting the broker's presence on the network. I'll explain this a little bit more, because when the broker starts up, it basically uses multicasting, UDP multicasting, to, to broadcast itself on the network to say, I'm over here. And I'll explain a little bit more about that when we look at the responsibilities of the worker. All right? The queue subsystem, obviously, it's handled to, to manage distribution of, uh, of requests. Um, so when, a, when the broker receives a request, it checks if there's a worker available. If there isn't, it puts it on a queue and waits for the worker to become available. And then at such time, it then sends it on. Uh, the logger subsystem records all requests and every minute detail of every single request. When it's received, when it's queued, when it's sent to a worker, what times, the, everything. We, type, we, we record every single minute detail as it goes through, that, through the ecosystem. Okay? The logging system also exposes a dashboard um, so that we can monitor and debug all the stuff. I'll show off the dashboard a little bit later as well. The RP system is quite simple. Um, it monitors connections between clients and workers. It's responsible to make sure that we have that reliable request, re request um, reply dialogue so that it disconnects peers on a heartbeat failure. There's a certain set of rules you can set to determine when, 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 heart, when a heartbeat fails. All right. So let's look at the worker now. All right. The worker. The, remember I spoke about the broker broadcasting itself on the network. So the main task of the worker is to actually listen for those multicast messages. Right? So when the worker starts up, it goes, are there any brokers available? Yes, there are. So then what it does is, it, if there are brokers available, it connects to them. The, this allows us to do something really cool. We didn't need to configure the worker to tell it what the IP address or port of the broker was. Okay? So we in production could literally start up a new server, deploy workers to that, start them up, and they would connect to the broker automatically. So we could scale very, very quickly. So if we saw load where a certain set of services weren't, weren't performing very well, we could start, up them, start them up and they would connect to the broker and everything would be hunky-dory after that. The same goes for a broker. So let's say the broker was, under, was, was a bit under pressure. We could start another broker. It would broadcast its network and all the workers that are already running would see that and automatically connect to it. So we had this scaling thing that we could do. And we, one of the things we want to do, because we run on AWS to do that auto-scaling and auto-descaling automatically within, it means that I can play more golf. So that's great. You understand? So that's basically my aim. Okay. The next thing that the, that the workers have to do is to obviously register services and documentation with the brokers. And I'll speak a little bit more about how it does that. And apart from processing requests, we also wanted the worker to be able to scale using threads. Okay? Um, the reason why we do that, it's, it's sometimes easier to scale using threads than to use processes, especially when your workload is, has a little bit of I.O. And I mean, everybody has a little bit of I.O., right? You're connecting to a database, you're writing to files, or you're doing some sort of HTTP request. Okay? And in our environment, that works quite well, because threads use a lot less resources than, than, um, than processes. Okay. So let's look at the client now. Okay? So the client, remember when I spoke about how we wanted everything to be developer friendly, so we, the, the, it should be familiar to the developer. So the client's main focus is exposing the framework in a language-specific manner. So depending on the language that the developer is using, because remember we wanted any language to be able to you, be used, um, then you should be able to, 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 the developer should feel comfortable with it. So in our environment, you could theoretically have, for argument's sake, a PHP, work, a PHP client 
connecting to a Python broker that is talking to a Java service. That essentially would be allowed within, within, within the framework. Okay? So even raising exceptions within, with, within, within the language should be how, how, how it works within that language. Okay, so now we get to the really fun bit, right? Let's actually look at what it goes into actually coding a service within the Clear Junction Services framework. But before I do that, I just want to get some definitions out of it, some terminology, so that if I start using the terminology, you understand in which context it, context it is. And this is basically our context, right? So what is a worker? A worker to us is an instance of a service. Okay? So what is a service then? A service is basically a collection of microservices. Think of it as a class. So it's just, a, just essentially a class, right? So then that makes obviously a microservice a method on that class. Right? Understand everyone? Nod? Yes? Awesome. Right. So let's look at a service definition, shall we? So remember I said a service is just a class? Well, that's exactly what it is. So there we go. I have my test service, and there's essentially two things you need to declare. The first one is those two properties, name and version, and those are essentially the message signature, oh, sorry, the um, server signature, right, that gets used by clients to call the service. And the second part is that you need to inherit from Zero Worker. Now, Zero Worker is part of the framework, and that does basically all the heavy lifting. As a, as a, if you're coding services, you actually don't need to understand the inner working of the framework. Okay, because you inherit it from Zero Worker and it does all the work for you. It connects to the broker, it does all of that, it registers your services, it does everything else. You, as a Python developer, just create your class and you go and you start writing methods. And I'll explain that. So let's write our first microservice, shall we? How does that look? There we go. So you write your first method, we wrote, and then we've written our first, our first microservice, it's called echo. It takes in a, a, a parameter called text and it basically returns that text to you. And that is it, people. In our framework, that, it is, that is how simple it is to write a service. Okay? If I started the service, you go python file.py, done. It starts up, connects to the broker, does all the work, and you can connect to it. Nothing more. Right? Sounds simple, right? Sounds too good to be true? Mm, no? Yes? I'll show it off a little bit later. We'll see that. So the obvious choice afterwards is now, how do I call that microservice, right? So now my service is running. I've got my test service running. How do I call it? There's essentially two ways to call it, right? The first one is via HTTP, which I'll talk a bit about later. But the more common way that we want to and the way we use within our, within our environment is we've created a zero client, some, so a client API. So you instantiate your zero client, you instantiate your zero client, and you set the service there by using the service signature as you see over there. You can also set things like your contract parameters, like you see there, I've set the request type to asynchronous. So within our framework, we support both synchronous and asynchronous requests. So you could submit something and fire and forget. All right? You can also set things like the timeout. So I set it there to one second. And then immediately after that, you can just call it. Like you call, like you would normally call a method on a normal object. Okay? The fact that that object is sitting on the opposite side of the network, you don't need to care about that. We care about that. The framework does. Okay. So everyone happy with that? Cool? Awesome? Right. So remember I spoke about scaling, how services can scale using threads? Right? So how do we do that? Again, very simple. It's a simple property on, on, your, on your worker. So you go threads per broker, and in this case, five. The default is one, so in this case, I've set up five. So what Z, the zero worker class will do, it will automatically scale, scale your, work, your service to be five workers. So when it connects to the broker, the broker will actually see five workers. Even though it's one process, it will see five workers. All right, so that's basically how we could scale. So you could scale via processes, via threads, or you could just go, you could go quite haywire around that. Okay, so that's essentially now more about, a lot about what our, how a service works. There's a lot more functionality around that, but I think this is enough for you. Okay, so what we've also done is we've built some kind of like features into the framework that kind of gives, I like to call it, we give our service, our microservices um, superpowers, right? So one of them is asynchronous, for example. So this forces, so it's decorators that we've implemented. So this forces you to uh, call a method asynchronously, so it's part of the message contract. So if you try and call it synchronously, it will fail immediately. The other one thing is like minimum timeout. So if you, for example, you know that you're, running, you're writing a microservice that takes X amount of time, and anything below that is going to fail no matter what, right? So you can tell the client, listen here, your minimum timeout is this. Anything below that, the request will fail, okay, immediately. It won't even, it won't even get called. Um, to expose services via HTTP, so we don't automatically expose all services via HTTP, you just use that at HTTP decorator and boom, everything else will work for you. You don't even have to worry about it. Okay? Next thing is scheduled jobs. So again, 
if you know the pattern, we've got a decorator for that. So we go at cron, you set it up, and it's done. It supports all the, all the uh, standard cron type uh, syntax, and there you see I call the cron twice. I'll call that twice. I'll show that a little bit later as well. So now, does everyone want to see that maybe in action a little bit? Shall we see that? Yeah. So just give me five seconds to just kind of swap between demo mode and actual. Uh, let's go. Maybe David can say some cool stuff about me again. David? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to put you on the spot again there, David. Hello. Does anyone have another joke for me? Please. And no, not you. No, no, no. Uh, sorry? Fun facts. 27% of all facts are made up on the spot. Um, I don't have my book here. It's fine, David, you're off the hook. Oh, hey, okay, cool, we're good. <laughs> uh, can everyone see that? Should I make it a little bit bigger? Should I make it a little bit bigger? Is that fine? You know, at the back, you guys are cool? Okay, so if we look at, obviously, our service now, Put together. So this is essentially our service, our test service. Um, I've made threads per broker 10 over here. So there we've seen I've created my asynchronous, my echo, my reverse. I've added that, and there's my get name, my long running. And essentially to run it, you just instantiate it. Okay, so let's do that, shall we? So I'm going to, if I can get to my, oh, sorry, not that one, this one here. I'll start my broker up. Oh, sorry, let me just do that. My bad. Let me see what's going on here. I'm not on the network. Why am I not on the network? Okay, let me just connect. Technical difficulties. Still not connected. Right. That's not going to work. Mm, come on. It, it worked this morning, I swear. <laughs> all right? I think David kind of jinxed me. It's all your fault, Dave. Okay, so I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. No, it's not. Still not connected. Mm. Am I too far away from the... It looks like it's not too... No? Uh, that's a pity, because I need a network in order to actually show it off. Um, do we have time for a phone there, David? Yeah? And maybe, yeah. Ah, excellent, thank you. So, the password's there. Are you, what's it, um, which network is it? It's the one with the strong signal below oh, that. This one, yeah? Yeah. Okay. SUP3. S3. Three. Three. Wait, three. wait, wait. SUP. SUP. RS3. Yeah. yeah. CR3T. Remember to change so that. Let's password. see if that works now. There we go. Excellent. Hee <laughs> hee. So there we go. So I've started up my broker. Yay! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I've, I'm going to start my test worker up. And automatically it would start up, it would then listen for the broker, and there we go, it's connected using my 10 threads that, it, that you saw there early on. And that's as simple as it is. I didn't tell my test worker where my broker was, it started itself up, right? Okay. Um, so now I'm just going to go a little bit here and just kind of like connect. So is that big enough for everyone as well? Yeah. So I'm just going to set up my clients. Uh, No, that's not how you spell client. There we go. So I've set up my client and I've connected to the broker, right? I've, that, so at this point, I could go client dot echo. That's not how you spell echo. Or client. Thank you. I just wanted to check if you guys were actually listening. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that, guys. Right. So I go client dot echo and I go. Th yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of the nose coming through. Sorry, guys. So there we go, and there we go. I got my echo back. Okay, just to prove to you that it does work, I'm going to call one of the other functions. Let's call the reverse function, for example. Right. So there we go. It's reverse Python. Right. 
And one of the, the stuff that reverse takes in is another parameter called true, which basically converts it to uppercase. Boom. Right? It also, you can also use your normal keyword arguments, and boom, it's done. All right, so that's simple, quite quick how it works. I'll just show you something as well. So if there's, like if the method doesn't exist, if the method doesn't, if you try to call something that doesn't exist, it throws a, the, the standard error. Um, you can't see it over there, but there you go. Service method does not exist, okay? I'm gonna show off, for example, if I try to call that, uh, why is it, ah, uh, damn it. That's not cool, okay, there we go. So if I try to call that asynchronous method, it will also raise an exception to say you're not allowed to because it can only be called asynchronously. So what I have to do is I have to set my request type to A and Bob's your uncle, now I can call it. Awesome stuff, right? So again, I'm gonna do the same thing with the, with the long running query, the long running one. So again, there we go. It says you're not allowed to run, run it because you're the minimum time it is 20 seconds, but you only supplied five. Okay, so then I can go client dot set my timeout to 20, one, two, three, and now I should be able to call it perfectly fine. And you'll notice there that the, this is supposed to be, I'm still calling it asynchronously, so it returned immediately to me, because I already set asynchronous, right? So if I were to now change that to synchronous again, and now I call it long running, now it will wait, okay? So it's gonna wait 15 seconds before it returns back to me because I, I sleep for 15 seconds in that, in that thing. So just give it there. So, ma, 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 ma. should've made it lower, right? Like five seconds or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, done sleeping, time to code, right. So how does that all look? So now, now that you've seen how it works in the real world, let's actually have a look at how the dashboard looks, shall we? So this is, this is the dashboard, let me just do that. So does everybody, can everybody see that? Can I make it a little bit smaller perhaps? Is that fine? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna be, I'll leave it like that. So at the top of the dashboard, you'll see on the left-hand side there, those things are basically a summary of all the requests that are currently in the system, how many are in progress and how many are queued. And on the right-hand side, it's essentially how many um, have failed or successful. And then you can actually delve deep, deep into it. You can actually start looking at them and you can start looking and seeing where they failed and what happened. And even better, you can start looking and clicking on there and then you go, oh, it failed in the client, it took, and there we go, and that's why it failed. Okay. You can start looking at information. We even store things like all our timing information, what type of request it was, where it failed, all of those kind of things we also store in here. So you'll see in this top piece here, you'll see your full stack trace if, if something were to fail. All right. So for example, here, you, you, okay, not that one, but if there's one failing, then you would see it. I'll probably get this one here. This one through, no, that one didn't through a stack trace as well. But we'll look at it a little bit later. And then you can also look at your successful transactions and see what happened there and, and, and be able to have a look at them as well. Okay, so it's the same type of architecture. So again, I'm just gonna do something with this long running query. So I'm gonna run my long running query, and then what you'll notice is if I hit refresh, you'll see now there's one in progress, and there we go. So it keeps track of all in progress tasks as well, and then you can see it's in progress, and you can see where it is and everything and all that kind of stuff. And then when it's done, it will either move to failed or successful depending on, on that. All right, the next part is we also expose our services here. So there you'll see there's our test service. And remember I talked about documentation? So we automatically take your Python doc string and your method signature and we convert it into here. It also takes the, the Python 3 type hinting and brings it into here so you can go in here and you can then see. So this is kind of like for developers to kind of figure out what do I need to do, what do I need to do, okay? We obviously expose this elsewhere. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Then our crons as well, so we expose our crons. Remember I said we, we, we got our two crons that's running? So there you go. Um, the one has an argument, it gives you your next runtime. It also gives you the last status of what happened when it ran. So this one failed, so I can go look at this one and go, what failed? Oh, it raised an exception on line 50. Awesome, thank you, and let me go look at what happened there. All right, um, this one passed, so great, let me have a look, that's fine. Thank you very much, so that worked. All right, so that's basically the, the dashboard, and we can filter and do all sorts of stuff. We can look at the past day, the past year, the past month, all those kind of things, and use this to kind of debug what's going on in our system. All right, everyone happy? All right. So let's look at exposing services via HTTP. So we use a, a Swagger interface that kind of does that. Remember, so we expose two services via HTTP. So here you go, we expose reverse. So that's how you would call it, test 1.0 and reverse and echo. So all the other services aren't exposed via HTTP. I'm not gonna go into much because David's already haggling me. So I won't go into much into that. Right, I'm just gonna go back into, just to conclude quickly. So let's see if I can go back into this mode again. 
Sorry, guys. Just give me. It's a bit of a. That one didn't switch on yet. Now. No. Let's try this again. Sorry. Yes, but now we just do that. There we go. Right. So we're back there. Okay, so we spoke about scheduled jobs, and we, and we obviously had the demo. So just to wrap up, I just want to talk about the benefits that we had. We definitely saw a major increase in productivity. Okay? Um, I can't give you the percentages. I'm not going to. That was many years ago. Um, but we definitely saw a lower IT cost. Our infrastructure, we, we could reduce our infrastructure. We run an AWS, and CPU and memory expenses is all you know. So we could run it on much, much less infrastructure, much cheaper infrastructure. And also because developing was so easy, or made it made a lot easier, it made maintenance a lot easier. We could also do more with less people. All right? um, we, we, have much less, we have less people than what we had seven years ago, but we are more productive with those, same, with the, with, with those less people. Okay? I just want to reflect on some of the stuff that we covered again. Again, like I said, microservices is best suited for large-scale applications. Do it right the first time and learn from your mistakes, but more importantly, learn from mine. All right? Okay, just quickly, I just want to say get involved. So as part of when we first developed this thing, our main goal was to actually kind of, once we were ready and we realized this thing's kind of stable and it's working, we've worked out all the kinks, we wanted to make it available to the greater open source community. So that is what we're trying to do. It takes a lot of work to do it. We haven't done it yet. We're almost there. But we've created a GitHub account for you guys to express interest. If you want to, contact me, and I'll keep you up to date of when that's going to happen. It's going to happen soon, so there we go. Um, and that's me, guys. Thank you very much. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something from that. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now we have some time for some questions. So if you have a question, then we have a hand. When we have a hand in the back, uh, we'll hand you a microphone. So, start with you. Okay, cool. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. I just wanted to know, obviously you spoke about the positives, but have you had any like negative feedback or issues as a result of moving to microservice architecture? Not really. I mean, there was, we actually had to change the way we, we develop stuff, and um, we had to think about how we deploy services. Um, so, one of the things we had to think about is how we scale our services and how, how we deploy things as well. So that was the kind of things we had to look at, but it's nothing that we couldn't solve. It wasn't like before where we had a problem and, we could, and there was really no solution. You had to kind of like really do things over, you know. Um, here we, had a, we, we came up with a problem. I'm saying we don't have issues, but essentially we always were, to find, we always were able to find solutions for them. Yeah. Uh, in your production environment, um, how many services are you running and how many brokers are you running? Um, in our production environment, we're running two brokers and about 300 services. Yeah, that's about how much we run. And we're running that on uh, basically each server is an 8 CPU machine with about, I think, 16 gigs of RAM. Right? Yeah, that's about what we're running. Hi. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, over and above unit testing, um, what do you use for, for testing across microservices? Things like contracts, uh, pack testing, um, anything excluding unit tests? Yeah, we kind of do uh, functional testing as well. So we build, we basically uh, do functional testing across our major functions. So things like registration on the website, for example. So we bundle all of those kind of things as one thing that goes across services. Um, so that's basically how we handle that. And we use um, Selenium for that. Hi. Just uh, one question quickly while I've got yeah. the mic. Would you mind going back a screen? That one there? Cool. That no? OK. And then, um, yeah. yeah, how do you solve the problem of um, uh, running all these services locally, like when you're doing local development? Um, well, I actually run the, it's so easy to run the environment locally, as you saw there. So yeah. it's not difficult to get up and running quite quickly. Um, essentially, I, I set up a VM. I installed the Z, our, our framework in it, Python setup.py install, and, and that's it. So if you, but if you're running sort of like 20 services all at once? I, I run our entire career junction infrastructure on my laptop when I'm okay. developing. So, and that's easy. It uses no, almost no resources on my machine. Okay, cool. All right. Cool. Uh, sorry, you mentioned 300 services, and previously also that you split the databases up. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to just go into more detail about that? Um, what exactly in more detail? Um, 
Uh, so uh, if you spawn a new service, does it have its own database? No, e well, each, like when I said each service, each service is a class. So each of those, yes, they will have their own database. Okay? So that's basically an architectural decision we made. Um, the framework doesn't enforce you to do that. I mean, the framework kind of gives you a mechanism to create microservices, but you can still write bad code. Um, <laughs> so yes, so um, it's, it's something that you need to decide. It's up to you how you guys want to work. You can work off one database if you want to. It depends what works in your environment and what works in your situation. So you didn't have the example of adding data and retrieving data? No, not, well, I didn't have the time for that. David wouldn't give me the time for it. So, yeah. No, I mean in production. So like Sorry? if, you, if you add a job and you want to get job details, if you go to the wrong server, so it's not good. Yeah, the wrong stuff. service. And the, the framework will tell you that that service doesn't exist there. So yeah, that would definitely tell you that. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Um, can you talk oh. a little bit about your continuous integration uh, setup? That is something that we're busy building. We, we, it's not yet fully up and running. Um, so that is something that is um, something that we're looking to do. Um, so if you have some ideas on that, that would be great as well. I, right? I noticed a distinct lack of uh, Docker in your, in your talk, kind of thing, which <laughs> yes, is really, um, really surprising. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so at the moment, for us, um, the way we deploy our services uh, works for us. We didn't need continuous delivery. Yeah. And we actually don't actually have any testers in our, in our, develop, in our team. Okay? So we, we kind of more like a wood agile type thing, so we, we also build a bit document light, right? So we requirements come in, we code it, and then, because we can deploy quite easily, and we can deploy 500 times a day if we wanted to. We yeah. could easily try something, oh, no, no, that didn't work. Just fix it, deploy, and it's done. Um, and we can deploy live. So we could take a service down, and you could, a client could call it, but it wouldn't fail immediately, because the service restarts, and the broker will go, okay, cool, now there's one there, because it just adds it to the queue. And then once the service comes back up, it will then send it on. So we could literally deploy live. Okay, right, cool. restart our services like that. Would it make sense to have a Docker container with the broker and your service inside the same thing? Then you can just like chuck out a, a new version of that? Definitely, or? definitely. Okay. That is something we definitely have on the cards, something we definitely want to look at. Okay, cool. I'm done. Hello. Uh, so say you have a feature that hits like three microservices. So you said something like user registration. So for example, yeah. um, whatever user registers and there's calls to three microservices in a certain order, what happens if one of them fails? Like what if the first one fails? What tells the next two? Um, like are you sending those messages um, asynchronously? And if so, if the first one fails, what tells the other two? Yeah. Like, don't that's do a that. very good question. Thank you for that. And that's something that I was going to touch on, but I, I didn't want to do that um, because time wasn't allotted. But it's essentially, it's a problem we have in microservices. Because microservices are stateless, they, essentially they, they don't keep state. So when you do things, how do you handle transactions, for example, across microservices? So that's one of the things that we, that we, that we want to improve on, on our microservices framework. And one way we want to do that is kind of like events. So let's say, for example, I'm taking money off your account because I can do that, right? right? Uh, and then um, I'll take the money off, but I'll, I'll pend, pend the transaction. I'll put it in like a pending state. And then the request will go to the other side to add the 500 bucks that now get added. And when that thing then, it then sends an event that, I, that the other one listens on and goes, okay, cool, you've done it, it's done. And then if it didn't happen, then it wouldn't do, it wouldn't do that. So how we handle that today is we typically put our transactions or things that are there in one, in one service for today. That's how we do it today. Okay. Um, but obviously, that's not ideal. We want to move towards more breaking up your services more logically. Okay. okay? Cool. Cool. Um, so when you realized, sorry, yeah. oh, there we go. When you realized that things weren't going great and you needed to redo the architecture, what was your approach um, into getting that started? Was it waterfall? Was it agile? And what sort of meetings were involved in that approach? Wow, now you're taking me seven years back. Thank you for that. Um, well, it's kind of like we, we, we it, was, it was kind of separate to the, to the we weren't, didn't choose any methodology at that point in time because we didn't know what we were going to do. It was a new team. We just decided, you know what, we're going to take this team outside of the company. It's almost like outside of the, the, the development life cycle, outside of the development team, and actually set them separately and send them on this tangent. It's almost like you created this mini company inside, you know, the startup that could do however they wanted to do that. And essentially we just did what, what came, what, what was familiar to us, you know. We just started coding and just started looking and just started going at it. So it wasn't really any, any methodology we, we, we adopted. Yes. Cool. So I'm confused. 
So you said you had about 300 services running. Yeah. Are those 300 individual unique services or are those uh, like no, those one are service No, 300 replicated? unique microservices. Unique, so unique, they're yeah, bundled yeah, exactly. as different services. I think m we probably have 20 or 30 actual services, like okay. services that run, but all in all, it's about 300 microservices. Okay, and then you said each of those are running on like a 8 gig kind of memory Amazon box. Is it that each of the services? Or do no, you no. We basically, so how we've deployed in, 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 in AWS, just to make it a little bit easier for us, we've basically mm -hmm. deployed, the, so one server can handle all our load. Okay. One so server actually, can handle all our load. So yes. basically one server is running all, all the services all the and, and the broker. We didn't need to do that. Okay. We didn't need to do that. We could put it on different services. Okay, that's fine. But for us, just to make deployment a little bit easier for us, we, we did that. And the second server is just there for, in case Amazon go, does something wrong and the other one is in a different availability zone. So, okay. And we so also load balance between the two. But that's up to you. You can decide how you want to deploy it. That's up to you. OK, cool. Uh, then theoretically, it wouldn't be that hard to separate it. So what you've done, it's almost like you've, so most people have got microservices services and they go, let's put everything on a different server. Yeah. You've said, well, let's keep the microservices, put them on the same server for now, and then you can just split them off as yes. needed and as load that's happens. That's great. OK. Yeah. OK, cool. Makes sense. For a moment, I thought that was, that was just thinking of this Amazon bull. <laughs> <laughs> 200 <laughs> services on different 8 gig boxes. Yeah. It's just something that struck me as a little bit odd. Why do you, when you say how many threads you want, why is it threads per broker, not threads total? Yeah, because you must remember, like I said before, you can have multiple brokers within your environment. And that worker will connect to all of the brokers. So when it starts up, when a broker starts up, it will create five workers with that broker. So when another broker starts up, it will create five workers with that broker. So in total, you'll have 10. It's threads per broker. OK. Yes, but why not just say 10 threads from the start? Uh, because you don't know how many brokers you're going to have. You could have three brokers, then you'd end up with 15 trades, 15 workers. Cool. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Imran. Uh, that concludes our question and answer session. Um, we are about 10 minutes behind. Uh, our talks are going to continue in uh, this room, and ooh, please check your schedules. Uh, we will, uh, session chairs, please give. Uh, everyone about, ten, uh, let's say everyone's going to start in about 10 minutes, and then we'll have a slightly shorter tea break, coffee break, but uh, we have a lot of talks to do, so thank you very much. Thank you.